those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hello and welcome back everybody. Hope you're all well. We're in Matthew chapter 3. It's a good place to start. We're going to get this series about John the Baptist underway, beginning in Matthew chapter 3. When you start going through the New Testament, beginning at Matthew, Matthew chapter 1 has the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 2 talks about the birth of Jesus Christ. And then Matthew chapter 3 is the entrance of John the Baptist 30 years later. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. That's Isaiah, the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 40, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptised of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. So a powerful entrance into the scripture from John the Baptist. And these are the verses we'll be mainly looking at today in Matthew chapter 3. We will be going through this chapter um, as this series goes on and a lot of other scripture besides, of course. So when we think of John the Baptist, Pretty much our first thoughts are that he was baptizing in the Jordan, that's the river, and that he speaks with great authority and power, especially here, a generation of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So it's strong language, it's very strong language in anybody's terms. But this would be particularly strong language. But this would be particularly strong language to a Jewish person in any time, at any place. But this is in Judea 2,000 years ago. And it's just incredible that John that he should come out and say something so bold and forthright and almost aggressive. I mean, we can't add tone to the text, but regardless of how this was spoken, the words are damning. And the expression generation of vipers was used later on by Jesus Christ. I'll show you that now. I'm going to lay these scriptures side by side as we build scripture upon scripture so we can see that what was going on, what John was saying, and how Jesus reiterated this expression, a generation of vipers. So this is from Matthew 12, verse 34. Jesus says, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And in Matthew 23, verse 33, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? So clearly you have both John and Jesus in the scripture using this expression generation of vipers and it comes with a warning 
who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Jesus says, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? And some will say that John here is calling out the synagogue of Satan. So we need to look at that because if that's the case, then we need to prove it. And if it's not the case, then we can dismiss it. So first of all, we'll look at this word vipers. See what scripture says about vipers. Isaiah chapter 30 in verse 6 mentions the viper in connection with the fiery flying serpent. The verse reads, The burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish from whence come the young and old lion, the viper and fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. So let's just go back up to the top of this chapter. In verse 1, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. So who are these rebellious children listening to? Well, if they're not listening to God, they're listening to Satan. That take counsel, but not of me. And that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit that they may add sin to sin. So we have the rebellious children that take counsel, but not of God. So they're listening to another voice that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit. They're of another spirit that walk to go down in Egypt and have not asked my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be an help nor profit, but a shame, and also a reproach. The burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and old lion, the viper, and the fiery flying serpent. So the viper is connected to the fiery, fire, fiery flying serpent. That's the dragon. Let's go into Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So Satan is known as the devil, that old serpent, the great dragon, the fiery flying serpent, the dragon, and the viper is connected to Satan. Okay, so we made a note of that there. Both John and Jesus talk about a generation of vipers. Jesus makes it clear for us about what John's talking about in these two verses, saying the generation of vipers are serpents. They're evil. They can speak no good things. And he says they're heading to hell. 
So we have these references set out here for us. So let's have a look at what Jesus actually says about the synagogue of Satan. So there's two references to the synagogue of Satan as that exact expression in the scripture. Both times spoken about by Jesus in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. So this is Jesus speaking to the church. In verse 8, And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Let's put Jesus' words down. So we have that down there. Let's go over to the next scripture now. So in the next chapter of Revelation, Revelation chapter 3, another mention of the synagogue of Satan. This is Jesus again. He's talking to the church and says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. We'll copy that as well, so we can get an understanding. So when we look at these verses, we tend to think, future tense, we tend to think this is of a time in the future, because we have future tense verbs in these verses, or at least in Revelation chapter 3, where Jesus says, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So Jesus is speaking about something that is to come. And because of this, we tend to think that the synagogue of Satan is something future. But the whole of this verse in Revelation 2 here is present tense. I know the blasphemy of them that are the synagogue of Satan. Present tense. And of course, which say they are Jews, but are and are not, but do lie. So we've got a lot of present tense throughout these verses. So what is the present tense? Well, the present tense is Jesus is speaking to the church. Jesus is speaking to us. Jesus is warning us of the synagogue of Satan. But the church age did, didn't start with us. This present tense dispensation doesn't start here. The church has been around since the first century. And these particular churches, the church of Philadelphia, the church at Smyrna, these are first century AD churches. So the synagogue of Satan has been around for a very long time. It isn't something new and it's not something that only pertains to the future, to the time of tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. This is something present, but it's also something past. If we think of when John was saying this, O generation of vipers, this was only a few short years before what we would call the church age dispensation. This is only three, three, three and a half years beforehand. So when Jesus is talking to the church in Revelation about something that exists in the first century, it doesn't mean it wasn't around before 
it doesn't mean that it wasn't around and known about in the time of John the Baptist. Yes, we get dispensational, we understand who Jesus is talking about, we understand verb tenses, we understand Jesus is talking about something future to come, but he's talking in the present tense. And he's talking something about something that Jesus already knows about when he's talking to the Apostle John in the Revelation. And it's important to understand this because getting a grasp of, of when Jesus is talking, when he what he's talking about, will prevent us from becoming hyper dispensational saying no John the Baptist can't be talking about a synagogue of Satan because that's before the church age when there's only a few short years in between this period the period of John the Baptist and the period of the Apostles uh, in the Acts of the Apostles after the uh, resurrection of Christ there's only a few short years in between and Jesus already knows He's speaking present tense about a synagogue of Satan. So it's not too far stretched to think that John is also not referring to a synagogue of Satan. Okay, so some will say that John the Baptist can't possibly be talking about the synagogue of Satan. Because Jesus says, of them which say they are Jews and are not, and we know that John was talking to Jewish people. But is Jesus really speaking about DNA? We tend to think, look at these verses and think of people that say they are Jews by their bloodlines, by their genealogies, by their DNA, but are not. But what if Jesus is talking about those that are Jewish, those that say they are the chosen of God and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan? Let's go back into Matthew chapter 3. So John the Baptist is definitely talking to bloodline, DNA, Jews, by genealogies. He says, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Now look. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Again, when we put these scriptures side by side, things start to make a lot more sense. John is saying, think not to say within yourselves. Don't lie. Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. They say they are Jews. For I say unto you, God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. John the Baptist is saying, it's not about their DNA and their bloodlines because those things are now done. As soon as Jesus Christ comes through the bloodlines and survives Herod's slaughter of the innocents and starts on his ministry, that's it. It's no longer important. Being Jewish now is about serving God it's making a choice, as Elijah said way, way back 
how long halt ye between between two opinions? If the Lord be God, then serve him. If Baal, then then serve him. And there's a great comparison that can be made looking at Elijah in First Kings chapter 18 and looking at John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3. Um, we'll look at those things in more detail later in this series because we can have a good look at uh, Elijah in this series. But what we're going to do first is we're going to have a, a look because we need to be breaking these verses down word for word. So we're going to have a look at what was going on in the synagogues at the time of Jesus Christ. Okay, so the first thing we need to know is what the word synagogue actually means. Now, it's made up in two parts, okay? Sin and agogi or agog. So the term agog or agogi simply means to teach or to learn. It's to do with teaching and learning. So for example, a pedagogue is a teacher of children and the science of teaching children is called pedagogy and an andragogue is a teacher of adults and the science of teaching adults is called andragogy. Okay, so that's all that agogi means or agog, agog. It just simply is to do with teaching and learning. Okay, a pedagogue is a schoolmaster. An andragogue would be like a university teacher or a college teacher. The word sin, or the root word sin, means to bring together or to gather. So the term synagogue itself simply means to gather, to teach or to learn. So a synagogue, so a synagogue in the biblical sense is really just a gathering place for worship and learning or reading and learning scripture. So let's have a look at what was happening in the synagogues at the time of Jesus Christ. So in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus goes into the synagogue. Now, which synagogue is this? Okay, I just went back into chapter 11 and this might well be at Capernaum, which was where Jesus and the disciples were immediately prior to coming into chapter 12 here. So it might be Capernaum, I'm not sure. Um, but he's being accused. Jesus is being accused by the Pharisees. Okay. His disciples were hungered and began to pluck ears of corn. Okay, they're out in the fields somewhere, uh, collecting corn to eat. So Jesus being accused by the Pharisees there. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, this is the Pharisees again, they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days, that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it? and lift it out. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. 
Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, from the synagogue. He withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Now, what are we getting from this? Apart from the fact that the Pharisees are trying to trip Jesus up, make accusations against him, make him say something that they can hold against him to condemn to condemn him. Well, this verse is very telling. When Jesus knew it, that the Pharisees were out to destroy him, he withdrew himself from the synagogue and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. There's a lot of sick people around. There seems to be a lot of people needing healing. When Jesus goes into the synagogue, there was a man with his hand withered. There's a sick man there. Let's go to another scripture. In Mark chapter 1, from verse 21, now again, this is at Capernaum. This might well be the same account. Um, this seems to be the same elements here of the Sabbath day. And he's entering into the synagogue, okay? So, they went into Capernaum, and straight away on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, O Holy One, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he, even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. So what we're seeing in the synagogue in Capernaum is unclean spirits. Mark chapter 6. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence have this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joses and Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honour, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hand upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marvelled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. So again, what are we seeing? Sick people. People lacking faith. He marvelled because of their unbelief. And he went around the villages teaching. 
In Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Yeah, and the Pharisees are never far away. So Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues. What does he find? Every sickness and every disease among the people. Let's go back to Mark chapter 1. So Mark chapter 1, 39, speaking of Jesus again. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. So we're seeing a theme here. Throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. Synagogues throughout all Galilee. We're seeing a theme. The theme is that Jesus goes round all the towns, all the villages. He goes into all the synagogues and he comes upon the same thing in these synagogues. Sick people, people with devils, unclean spirits. And there's a whole ton of scriptures. I mean, I'm not going to go through much more now with these scriptures on the synagogues. But if you look for the Old, uh, for the New Testament, you'll see the same thing happening time and time and time again. Sick people in the synagogues. And really it shouldn't be like this. The synagogues are places where believers gather to read, to teach, to learn scripture and to worship God. They're basically substitute temples. So you have the temple of God in Jerusalem and then in other towns and villages both in Judea and in the other regions the northern kingdom which was called Israel of course it's kind of annexed into regions now such as Samaria and uh, Galilee Decapolis etc but Jesus is going throughout all these synagogues and finding the same thing a broken system a system where you should have spiritual well-being. There should be spiritual well-being in these synagogues. And you're finding the opposite. And no mention of the Levitical order. The Levites should be, there should be a Levite present in every Jewish community. Wherever there's a Jewish community and a synagogue, you should be seeing Levites who are the spiritual leaders of the Jewish people. But you're not. The only thing you're seeing at synagogues is Pharisees, diseases and unclean spirits. The synagogue of Satan. There's one mention of synagogues in the Old Testament, just the one mention. It's here in Psalm 74. This is quite a fascinating scripture. And the first two verses here are incredibly important. Okay, so it's a son of Asaph, or a maskil of Asaph. It just that just means poem or song, it's the same thing. Now pay attention to the first couple of verses here. O oh God, why hast thou cast us off for ever? Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Wow, what is going on here? What on earth is going on in this scripture? Who is Asaph talking about? Remember thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed, 
this Mount Zion wherein thou hast dwelt. So look, look, at, look at the language going on here. Why hast thou cast us off for ever? Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Well, okay, it's poetic. It is hyper, hyperbole of a kind because in verse 2, the people, the us, the sheep of the pasture, is referred to as God's congregation and the redeemed. Okay? So there's a great juxtaposition here in these two verses. This hopelessness in verse 1 and then this bringing into remembrance in verse 2 that actually these people are God's congregation. They are his redeemed. They are those he has purchased of old. Okay, but this introduction in these first two verses sets out what we'll see as we go down through this uh, psalm. Lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations, even all that the enemy have done wickedly in the sanctuary. All that the enemy have done wickedly in the sanctuary. This is the enemy within. We're being told about the enemy within. There is an enemy within. This isn't something new in the gospel accounts. It's not something something simply that Jesus is talking about in the future when he talks about the synagogue of Satan in Revelation. There's an enemy within. Here we are. Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. Wow. Do you know what this reminds me of? It's very similar to the way the Apostle Paul spoke about the wolves in the church in the period of in, in the period of the church. Okay. Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. They set up their ensigns for signs. A man was famous according as he had lifted up axes upon the fig trees. But now they break down the carved work thereof at once with axes and hammers. They have cast fire into thy sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burnt up all the synagogues of God in the land. They have burnt up all the synagogues of God in the land. Now this is the only reference to synagogues in the Old Testament. Okay. So we're being told something here in the Old Testament that has meaning, significant meaning in the New Testament, in the Gospel accounts. So again, is this just poetic language? Is this hyperbole? Is this poetic language? They have burnt up all the synagogues of God in the land. Or is this literal? Have the enemy within literally destroyed the high places of God? Or is this a prophecy? They said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burnt up all the synagogues of God in the land. 
Now, if you're in any doubt at all that the synagogue of Satan was in operation during the Gospel accounts, let's look at more verses in the Old Testament that show us clearly that there's a synagogue of Satan in operation. Scripture we've been to before, previous videos. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 8. This is God showing Ezekiel a vision of the temple. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping thing, an abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan. Now, these are real people, okay? This is a vision of God showing Ezekiel about the temple. But these are real people. In the midst of them stood Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. So this wicked, well, it's basically Baal worship going on in the temple, the enemy within. Let's just remind ourselves of Malachi chapter 1. Malachi 1. Verses 5 and 6. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. A son honoureth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honour? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. And ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. Priests in the temple, priests that despise God's name, them which say they are Jews and are not, like priests in the temple that despise God's name, men in the temple that worship idols and burn incense to creeping things and beasts and all manner of abominations, Pharisees in the synagogue, in the synagogues that are full of sicknesses, diseases and devils, Jews that are not Jews, would it be so far-fetched to say that what Jesus is speaking about here is not DNA, is nothing to do with bloodlines? Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. When Jesus called out the generation of vipers in these verses, both of these verses, he's talking to the Pharisees. But who's John talking to here? Maybe we should look at that again. So John the Baptist turns up at the River Jordan. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptised of him in Jordan confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come? 
Who's he talking to? When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, Who? Who's he saying this to, O generation of vipers? Is he saying this to the Pharisees and Sadducees? Or is he saying this to Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region about Jordan, everyone? Who is John the Baptist calling a generation of vipers here? Let's break this down. They went out unto him, basically all the people of Judea. Okay. They were baptised of him. But when he, John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come, he said unto them, is he saying this to all Judea? Or is he saying this to the Pharisees and Sadducees? O generation of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Because Jesus only said this, O generation of vipers, to the Pharisees. But if the implication in this scripture is that John is talking to everybody, how will that affect our understanding of what he's saying here? Let's go to Luke chapter 3. Okay, in Luke chapter 3, in verse 1 and 2 here, we have a, this is a set out hierarchy of what's going on in Judea at the time. Okay, but in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the word, of the, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So John is obeying God. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he unto the multitude that came forth to be baptised of him, O generation of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptised of him, the multitude. That's everybody. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now let's go back. So Luke chapter 3 says that he says to the multitude that came forth to be baptised of him, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about round about Jordan and were baptised of him. But when he saw, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, those that were baptised of him, he's talking to everybody, he's talking to everybody. O generation of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Everybody. You see, the situation was absolutely abysmal. 
at the time that Jesus Christ started his ministry, the situation was dire. It was really dire. And what we're going to see as we go through this series is we're going to see the how and the why. When we look deeply, deeply into John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, we are going to see that there is no longer a Levitical order in operation. It's been usurped by the synagogue of Satan. And scripture reveals it through John the Baptist and through Jesus Christ. Amen. So I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to put out a video shortly. I'm going to put out a video about prophecy before we go back into John the Baptist. Now I'm going to try and get, there's probably going to be at least four or five videos in this series about John the Baptist. It is, it does run deep. It runs very, very deep. Um, so maybe three or four more videos about John the Baptist. Before I do that, I'm going to put a video out about prophecy, about understanding prophecy. Because whether we're looking at Old Testament prophecy that brings us into the gospel, into the gospel accounts, into the ministry of Christ, or whether we're looking at New Testament prophecy and revelation that speaks about the end times, it all points to the cross. And it's so important to understand this because the focus is on the cross. It's on the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Always. Always. So I'm going to put, hopefully in the next day or two, I'm going to put out a, a much shorter video about prophecy, understanding prophecy. Um, it will be in, in this playlist as well. Okay, so there's a John the Baptist playlist. There's already three videos before this one in that playlist, which is the groundwork. This is the first real beginning of this series, if you like, but there's some groundwork that I've done in a, a few videos before this, which is really background information, a lot of Old Testament scripture. Okay, but we'll be going through uh, Matthew chapter 3 in full. We'll be going back into Luke chapter 1, which we haven't been to in this video, um, in much more detail. We'll be looking at, uh, obviously, all things concerning John the Baptist, including the imprisonment and death of John the Baptist. That will be a video in itself. We'll be looking at Elijah, because John comes in the power and spirit of Elijah. So there'll be a video really just looking at, at what's going on with how John the Baptist is connected to Elijah and the comparisons there. That'll be very interesting, definitely be very interesting. Um, we'll also be going into the crucifixion accounts of Jesus Christ as well. Um, and we'll be looking more into Jesus Christ toward the end of this series. This series is going to lead us into ultimately a greater understanding of Jesus Christ but it also goes deeply into uh, the prophets, the Levitical order and the Pharisees in great detail as well. So the grace of Jesus Christ be with you all. I hope you're going to I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you'll stay uh, with the channel and see this series out. I'll try and get more of it out in January. I doubt if I'll get the whole series out in January, but um, definitely be aiming to get, try and get another couple of parts of this out during January, and then we'll try and get it all tied in together by uh, sometime in February at least. Okay, so. God be with you. Stay in the scripture. Stay in prayer.
love God because he loved us first. Amen.